Sammy Morton, mm. welcome to High Street Social Club. Thank you for having me. Appreciate your time. <laughs> no worries, man. So, um, uh, like we were just talking before, uh, before we started, SK Design. It started off as Sickness Design. Yep. SK Design. Yep. Now SKDA. Yep. Absolutely. SKDA USA. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> you simple like... progression. Simple progression. It started off as yeah, Sickness, spelt S I K N E S S. Um, obviously I was quite young when I started the business I was 18 or 19 around that age and at the time everything is fully sick of course yeah yep. the name sickness came out of that yeah um, and it was awesome at the time it was wicked and it did exactly what I wanted it to do and built the brand around that name um, got to a point not too far in probably two or three years in where I realized that the name itself was sort of then aiming at a demographic you know the younger yep. sort of yep. side of writing um, and I realized I wanted to reach a much broader demographic than that so I decided I wanted to adjust the name. Yep. Um, and the logo was actually already an S and a K, which came out of the name the sickness. sickness. Exactly. Yep. So at that stage, people were already referring it to it on the side as SK because of the logo. Yep. So that seemed to pretty flow pretty well. So I yeah. just ran along with it. And before you know it, it was <laughs> SK Design. Do people ask you what it stands for now? Yeah, all the time. And I give them that full spill. That full yep. 30 seconds we just had, that's exactly what I give them every time. And that's a good little story because it shows a bit of history. It shows a bit of progression. And it, and I think like it definitely shows some maturity as well. Absolutely. So Absolutely. it... Um, you know, what what do you actually do? Ah, uh, cool. So we are a very specifically, we're a custom motocross graphics company. So we make uh, custom design and cut decal sets for dirt bikes. Specifically, that is all we do. We have a couple of other accessories that sort of complement our graphic designs and sticker sets, but that's it. That's literally the entire company is just designing and printing stickers. And that's a lot of stickers mm, because every single dirt bike that basically leaves the showroom floor, mm. everyone wants to personalize it. Everybody wants to protect it, and that's I mean, it's twofold what the, what your uh, what your product does, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah, exactly right. And it's becoming the way that you know technology is developing, and and even just the general industry is developing. It's becoming a lot more accessible to get custom stickers because of you know online shopping and yep. the internet age. Excuse me. That's um, right. And therefore, um, the the market itself to sell to for people wanting stickers is growing at the same time as us, you know, the business. Yeah. You know, it's, it's more accessible, you know, instead of just the racer who needs his logos on there for his sponsors, it's now just, you know, the regular Joe Blow who has a dirt bike and think wants to make it look different to his mates. Yeah, yeah. And you're kind of bucking the trend a little bit as well because, I mean, I remember, um, you know, big, massive companies or from what we see, big, massive companies like One Industries and One Industries were always like my favorite uh, graphics company. They were the most progressive. They were the most out there. And they just had a really fucking cool kit. But they dropped away so fast. And that seems when you started to come up, I mean, you, you, were, you were doing quite well in the Australian side of things. Yep. And when did you pick, start picking up uh, some traction in the States? And uh, It sort of it was, came naturally with no real effort. Um, again, because of online and the world of online, anyone can mm. see anything from anywhere. So it just organically, I think, you know, some people must have picked up on it over there. Um, we worked pretty hard on making our style really unique. Yep. I almost intent to, intentionally, sorry, always avoid following trends. Yeah. I want to set them. I don't want to follow them. I yep. don't ever try and do that. Therefore, I'm doing something that everyone's either going to absolutely love it or hate it. Yep. So all I had to do is get seen by someone on some side of the world and they realize it looks nothing like anyone else, anything else rather. Yeah. And therefore they want to get a hold of it. And because of you know the internet and postage, it was easy to do that. Yep. And then it became organic growing from there until we decided to push it. And, and where did you start? Well, the company itself? Yeah. Yeah, there's a pretty cool tagline behind that even. So basically, yeah, motocross stickers, as I as mentioned, you know, they're, they're to, it's a way to customize the dirt bike, um, make it look you know, other than just standard. So back when I was racing, I used to race competitively, just state level, but enjoyed it and worked pretty hard at it. Yep. 
Um, I had an idea in my head. I saw a picture of a Troy Lee Designs bike somewhere and just thought it was amazing. And I had an idea of a way to customize that to make it just look wicked. Yeah. Um, so I had a had in my head a perfect picture. I went to a couple of custom graphics companies which do exactly what I now do. Yep. Had them try to redesign what I wanted. Yep. And me being a fussy little kid with a picture <laughs> in his mind, you know, no one could get it the way I wanted it. And it was just frustrating me. So I got onto publisher on a computer which i was really good at i always used to use publisher yep. made up my own templates with the drawing tool and designed up the way i wanted it um and then took it to one of these printing companies and said this 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 is what i this want. is exactly Make what this. i want and yeah. they did yeah um printed it up i paid them for printing the job of course and applied it to my bike it was beyond stoked with it. i was really, really happy yeah uh, and then a mate of mine said man that looks sick can you do one for me so did you have a background in graphic design at all? Is that what you did at school or, I mean, did you go to uni or anything like that or TAFE or? Yeah, no, so I didn't. So I, I always used to draw as a kid, um, like the drawings that you have on your desk, literally. <laughs> I was looking at it before and, you know, brought my memory straight away. Like this is the stuff I used to do. Yeah, absolutely. Just on paper. Um, and I just really, really enjoyed that. Um, and then in year eight or nine, I reckon it was in nine design, which I was trying to do because I thought that might be something I wanted to go for. Yep. Um, I had a really, you know, teacher I didn't get along with at all and he didn't get along with me. I think our personality has just clashed. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, about six or nine months into that year, he came up to me and had a meeting with me and my parents actually and said, look, don't put Sam back in design. He doesn't have any history. He's not, no future in design. It's, you know, this guy's useless. He doesn't want to be oh, here. He's not a lovely guy. Get yeah. Get out, you know, don't yep. come back. So that was the end of it. I dropped the tools and didn't touch them again um, until, you know, this time when I decided I want to make a kit. So of course I was had some history in design and drawing and then yeah, I was yeah. into bike. So it sort of naturally meshed. And I think that's, I mean, that's the biggest thing I think is that people work within their passion. Mm. When somebody's passionate about something and, and when you really want to do it, it's, it, it's, it's a personal challenge to do something and it's a personal challenge to get something done. It doesn't matter if it's drawing something or racing or, or if it's succeeding in business or, or it's what you make of it. And it's, it's, it's a bitter pill to swallow when you get people that are um, uh, professional educators that don't understand passion. Yeah, for sure. And and that's uh, that. Have have you ever uh, have you ever caught up with that teacher nah, since? I'd I'd like to. It I'd would be to so meet funny. He would like to meet him just to sort of have a chat and look back at it and have a bit of a laugh. Yeah. But uh, no, I haven't had the opportunity yet. Damn. Maybe make him a sticker kit and fucking <laughs> send it to the school or something. Yeah, that'd be good fun. One day, <laughs> one day. But that's it. I think teachers, you know, they're there to do a job and you, you can have personalities that don't fit. You know, we're all human. It's, you're yeah. not going to get along with everyone all the time. That's exactly right. And it's right. sort of a bit, it's a bit sad that, you know, even that happens in the teacher to student situation, but it does. Yeah. Um, and it proved that his one opinion, although we all took it pretty seriously at the time, was actually completely completely invalid. Yeah. So, you know, you can't let someone's one person's look on you or what you're doing hinder the whole situation. So when did you decide to make this a, I, I guess, a business, not a hobby or not just helping out a few mates with a few designs? Yeah. When, when did you think, fuck it, I'm it's going for of, it? <laughs> it sort of naturally progressed. Like it's, you know, since then at the first I did mine and I did a friend's and I did another friend's and it didn't take too long. I was at actually at a point in myself where I was struggling to sort of see what I wanted to do with my future. I didn't know. I wanted to get a cool career and an awesome job. I didn't yep. know what it was yet. But I knew it wasn't just a normal job. You know, yep. I wanted something something different. So you're not a um, nine to five kind of guy? Yeah, and I, I don't think I ever could be. Um, so I was sort of waiting for that. And then when I had a few mates, you know, say I want to do it, I want to do it. And I got another one and got another one. And, you know, did a couple of orders and kind of got an invoice system set up and things like that. It didn't yep. take long to naturally be like, all right, this is it. This is what yeah. I'm going to do. And, and from then I never had another look like that was done. That's my focus. That's what I'm going to do. And, and how did other people take that? Were other people steadfast and going like right behind you or were they uh, trying to like, hey man, was, what are you actually? It was pretty divided, definitely. You yep. know, it's a real divided thing. You have your close friends and close family that think it's a cool idea and want to get behind it. Yep. And then of course you have some even close friends and close family that want to pretty quickly steer you away from it because they're you know worried for you and your future and we're wasting your time, things like that. You know, start of any business especially, you know, for a young kid with an idea. Yeah. Um, you know, your parents and your people around you want to point you back in the right direction and help you get somewhere good. Yep. And then, of course, there's just, you know, of the age that I was of 19, 20, there's, you know, bunches of people and groups of, you know, gangs or whatever you want to call them, groups yep. of people that just decide they don't like you and they'll do anything to put you down. So yeah. it was pretty, pretty... And that's mixed. a real thing as well, man, especially when it is something that is, I guess, a, um, a close-knit community that's quite spread out like the motocross scene and and motor, motorcycles in australia especially if you look into like uh, outer metro country australia motorcycles are massive and they're people are really passionate like you get 
Yamaha people that will not fucking ride anything but a Yamaha and the same with Honda, the same with Kawasaki, the same with Suzuki. And there's the same type of passion behind products behind that as well, you know. I'll only use these tires, I'll only use these grips, and of course, I will only use this graphics company. Mm. And um, I, I know through experience that I've definitely seen a whole lot of people that um, maybe haven't applied things properly or, or with quite as much care as what they could have, and then, you know, stickers peel off. And it's like anything, if you stick something on something that's not prepared, it's not gonna, it's not gonna take. And how do you, as a startup, as as a young guy who's putting this stuff out there you want to get your name up you want to get things behind you how do you deal with those type of things or that kind of feedback of people and it's so easy keyboard warriors and yeah yeah it's tough man that's something that i've dealt with the whole time of course and even still today yeah um you know dealing with the negative feedback and because of so often as you mentioned it's not the product it's not anything to do with us yeah the way it's been applied or the way it's been used um, and the customer will never believe you. They'll never look past their own point, yeah. of yeah. course. You know, they're right, of course. Yeah. Um, which makes it really, really difficult to deal with, especially with something like stickers that are so volatile. You know, you can put them on slightly wrong or do something just slightly incorrect and the life will go from a year, which it should be, to yeah. a week if you're lucky. How good are your instructions? Yeah, pretty And do simple, people read pretty them? Pretty straightforward. Yeah, look, we get people asking for instructions. You know, how do I do this? And we send them on the back of every packet. You know, yep. people just need to slow down and pay attention. It's all the information there. Yeah. But it's not a difficult process. It's really not. Like getting it right as long as you read your instructions, so you know what you're doing. Um, so what is the right way? Was I doing it right in oh, the second close, bit? or <laughs> it, it does sort of matter, uh, sorry, rely rather on the material you're using. Yeah. So which you won't know as a customer. You know, you're just receiving a kit. Um, there's different companies all around the world that you will use a vast range of different vinyls. Do you use a specific like, like a vinyl material for yeah, yours? Yeah, we do. We get some stuff out of the States, which most of the major companies are using now. Yep. Um, the industry is getting a bit tighter in that area. Everyone sort of knows what everyone's doing. Yep. Um, but the material that we're using is made for applying. It's made to make your life as easy as possible. Um, you know, you don't touch soapy water anymore. Yeah, um, right. You use a bit of heat to help you out and you take yep. your time and it's, it's not a difficult task. You've just got to be ready for it. <laughs> Put some time aside, grab a beer, you know, yeah, relax, grab a beer. spend a couple of hours. So it does Don't still uh, require a couple of beers Absolutely. and a bit of patience. And yeah, no rushing, you know, that's the worst thing. One of the biggest tips that I can give everyone, which is absolutely necessary for every graphics kit in the whole world, is people get new plastics and they think that they're, you know, they're brand new. Don't need to do anything, put the sticker straight on. However, yep. with all new plastics, they come with a wax coat on them, which yep. protects the plastics. But graphics won't stick to that coat. No. So you can put a kit on. You, you can feel perfectly. that as well, can't you? You can, and you can see it. It's really shiny. Once you yep. get that off, they plastics go a bit matte straight away. Okay. And you know you're ready to rumble. But if you put yep. on that wax, you can do everything else right. I did it myself with yep. one of my kits once. Didn't realize. Just learned <laughs> that day. Put it on, and it started falling off in the shed, and I couldn't work out what was going on, and found out that yeah, new plastics and need to clean. Do your um, do your because some some aftermarket plastics are a little bit different than mm -hmm. what OEM plastics are, and and maybe just in the sharpness of their creases on the on the plastic or mm -hmm. slight different shapes. Are you based on an OEM bike or are you based on a specific brand or? We cater for that. So um, in our you know, standard order sheets that we have online, there's a section there that asks you what plastics you have on your bike. Yep. Um, and if any of the plastics that you do have are not OEM and they're listed there and they do somehow differentiate from OEM, we'll cater for that in the design. We'll make sure that you know the, the template we use is made to fit whatever you've got. Yep, so you, yep. it's not something the customer should have to think about as long as they spend their time to put the information in initially. Do you know how many kits you've made? <sighs> That's a nah, no, no clue. Absolutely no. Thousands idea. and thousands. Yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, it'd be, it'd be well above ten thousand. I couldn't even tell you. At yep. the moment, we're doing anywhere sort of one hundred and fifty plus per week sets. Man, so you know, there's that's a, a lot of a lot of weeks of that sort of workload. You know, it's definitely a pretty high number. Yeah, yeah, and and where's where's the majority of that going? Uh, at Where the are moment, the kits it's all pretty going? Spread, um, Australia and America share probably forty percent each at the yep. moment of our entire workload. Yeah, okay. Um, and then the other twenty percent would be made up of New Zealand and Europe, and you know, we get a few orders to Dubai and other places like that. Um, where's the weirdest place that one of your kits has gone? Oh, we had an order not long ago to uh, Syria, I think. No shit. Mm, with, and obviously there's a fair bit going on there at the moment. Yeah. Um, and the only way we could get it in is we had to sh actually had to ship it to a neighbor country and then have it arranged to get it across because you couldn't ship there for some reason. Who the fuck's riding a motorcycle yeah. in Syria? I don't know, man. I don't know what's going on there. You know, someone's got coin and a motocross <laughs> track ready to go and they're not too yeah. worried about what else is going yeah, on. So. Yeah, uh, I mean, we might all be surprised. There might be a really thriving kind of uh, motocross culture going over on 
in I guess everything's blown up, man. It'd be pretty good to get around on a motocross bike rather than a fucking Corolla or something be, like yeah, that. Yeah, you're right. It'd be a lot easier to get around. Yeah, yeah. So what what do you do in motorcycling now? I mean, you're you're obviously doing some graphics and doing a great job with that. You, you're still racing? Uh, yeah, uh, barely. Um, I still ride a bike. I have a bike. I ride yep. rec- recreationally and absolutely love it. Yep. I love the social side of riding. I yeah, yeah. As that's a major part of our sport now. As it probably yep. always has been, but for me, you know, getting older, you really pick up on that. Sure. I have an excuse to go out and be still not old, friends. man. Sorry, older, older, <laughs> older than eighteen. Um, but go out and you know, with friends and catch up and have a laugh and go for a ride and pick on each other's technique and just have a good time is really where I see the value of it. Yep. Racing is a whole different ball game. You know, it's almost a different thing completely, um, which is fun if that's what you want to be doing. But it's you know, it's a whole lot of tension and stress and things like that. Yeah. Which for me now, I don't want on my weekends. You know, I want to just relax and have a good time with mates and chill out. And, and does that change the way that um, that you think you're designing your kits? Do you think that you've got more of a uh, an open feel to what you're putting in or just that instead yeah. of just that hardcore racer kind of input? Yeah. Or? Yes, 100%. I completely agree with that. And that's something that I sort of, I feel like I snapped to that not long ago, maybe a year ago or something like that. I remember having a conversation with a friend about how I realized, you know what? I reckon, I, at the time it was an assumption, I said, I reckon that more of our kits are sold to people that don't race than do. Mm. And I was just an assumption, so I did a bunch of research and talked to a bunch yep. of customers, called a whole lot of people up and spoke to them and found out that in fact it was you know above 70% of our sales wow. were going to people that don't race. So no what shit, that means, that's a lot. Yeah, and what that means, it's fantastic from a design point of view, mm. design point of view, is that therefore all of regulation and all of the necessities that you need on a kit and the positions and the logos and the colors for racing, yep. thrown out the window because most of our sales aren't going to races, True. which means things like the color of your background and how big the number has to be and what style it can be in is suddenly completely gone. And at that stage, we started selling kits and advertising kits that had different color regulation numbers on the front to the sides, which yep. is a big no-no in racing. Yep. But if it's not for racing, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. No one had done that. No one had been doing it in the whole world. We did it. And it went off and you know everyone wanted that kid and that look of that different you know the differentiation from every other kid on the market yeah and it didn't take long for the whole world to follow and now every graphics company all around the world does it and and some of your kits i mean i remember was that the series that you had that was kind of um it was like almost ghosted graphics into it and stuff and yep. and and it did look very different than any kit that Absolutely. had ever gone on and it almost gave it a um I don't know like it was a, it was definitely like a stealth kind of look to it but it was super clean super stealth and I, I think in the in 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 our day and age, everyone wants something different, mm-hmm. but nobody wants something too different. Yeah. And and if it's you know short, sharp, and shiny, if it's clean, if it looks good, if it's not if it's not um, as in your face as as maybe a racer's kit might be. You know, you're a racer, you want to pop, you want to stand out from everybody else. So everything is fucking bright. Mm-hmm. It's sharp. It's fucking bang. It's out there. Yeah. But you don't necessarily want that on the weekend because no. people expect you to be really fast if you've got a fast looking fucking bike with all the sponsors on it and all of that stuff and I'll tell you I think I've had that before and I was fucking slow <laughs> like real slow so that was disappointing for everyone involved but um, it, if you've got 70% of your business going out to non-racers mm-hmm. do you know how many people that are racing are on an SK Designs kit? Yeah, that's a pretty interesting question. We've looked into that. We've done a bunch of research, obviously. Um, mm. Market research is a really important part of growing a business, especially once you get to you know a size where you can make some money. Yeah. Um, and we've looked hard and wide. It's r- far and wide. It's really hard to nut those sort of numbers down. Yeah. Um, we think that we don't have any more than 5% of the world market. If we think it's probably under that, most likely. Yeah, right. Which means that the market's massive. Um, yeah, but yeah. with that being said, as far as our research can tell, there's no one that's far ahead of us in any way yep. on the planet, which pro- simply proves that there's just it's massive. You know, there's so much market out there. There's so many little companies that are thriving and doing what they need to do. And uh, since one industry is closed, which was you know five years ago now, something yep. like that, yep. the, I feel like the world's waiting for that next big. You know, the, where's Absolutely. the company? Where's that yeah. mob going to stand up and going to take the, you know, majority of the market? which is, of course, what we're aiming to do. So, yeah, you're aiming to do that. Who's who's on the other side? Who's who's your biggest competitor that you see? Uh, there's a bunch of competitors out there. Um, there's uh, companies from you know America that are doing really well. There's a couple of others in Australia that are doing really well. Yep. 
Um, it's a pretty spread out field, but no one, yeah, there's no one that's got their head out in front of the whole game and running the show. There's probably five or six companies in the world that are on our tier, yep. and there's no one above that. And of course, our focus is to do exactly that. And how do you go about the licensing of, of stuff? Like, you know, like with some of the big brands, mm-hmm. you can't just go reproducing their logo. Of course. And thinking that they're not going to uh, notice at some point and go, hey, man, what's going on here? So do you, do you have to pay them money? Do you have to get licensing from them to be able to do it? Is there, what, what's the process in that? Sure. So it's a pretty, um, yeah, it's a pretty open field. Um, most of the mobs in the world, you know, the big companies, they know and expect that their brand's going to get shared around. Um, most of them love it because it's free advertising for them. And if people yep. want to rep their brand and chuck it in their bike and show it to the world and they're only being helped out by that process. So most people don't have an issue. Yep. Um, there are companies that you speak to and you make sure you're on good terms with so you can get the clean ticks and you know written approvals and things you need to. Yep. And then, of course, there are other mobs out there that go ahead and sell licenses. Yeah. Um, Arcadium and Husqvarna, for example, they do exactly that. They sell licenses, they pick people to sell them to, and then they won't sell them afar from that. Yep. Um, and then there are other brands like Nitro Circus, for example. Yep. We actually have the exclusive worldwide license for them. So we're meant to be the only ones that are selling Nitro kits in the world. So we yep. pay them a royalty to do so. Um, but again, it's really yeah, That's a fair out. achievement, isn't it? It's really cool, yeah. It's that's cool thing to awesome. Have. Yeah. Do you get free tickets? Yeah, we are do. Are you going to the Nitro World Circ... Uh, what was that, the... Nitro Circus World Games or something that yeah, they've got in like fucking Utah or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, we get we, we get whatever access we want to get. So yep. if we need something from them and want tickets, they'll they'll supply as as requested. And that's I mean that's where I see I mean and being outside of the motorcycle game for a while now, that's where you still see massive um, massive promotion mm. and huge cross promotion as well because those people are they're not only doing motorcycles you know they're doing scooters and BMXs they're fucking jumping couches and stuff on mega ramps they're they're doing all sorts of just stupid dumbass shit that every kid wants to do but they're doing it to just an unbelievable level it's the stuff that they're pulling off I mean did you see Travis Pastrana doing a double backflip triple twist something or other yeah, fucking I did actually. he didn't even like he didn't stop flipping or twisting until he hit the ground and somehow he, he lands the right way i'm like fuck yeah they're pretty cool they're just nuts characters and yeah it is it's a big promotional field they've got a massive following that goes far beyond their typical races mm. so it's a pretty cool company to be involved with yeah yeah have you have you ever thought about getting outside of what the motocross stuff is as well have you have you looked at other things that uh that sammy can stick a sticker on yeah, of course. Um, that's something that gets recommended to me all the time, mostly from people that don't have any concept of how big and successful our companies become in our very yep. small and niche field. Yeah. Um, you know, when so you people still go, and, huh? Yeah, you know, you should diversify. Do sign, man. Do cars. You know, why aren't you doing this? Um, yep. We are, me and my staff, we're, you know, we're trained graphic designers and sign yep. writers, and we yep. have sign writing equipment. Therefore, we can do anything. We can do signs, cars, whatever. You name it. To do with printing, we can do it. Yep. However, at the moment, what I enjoy doing and what I focus on doing is bikes. Yep. And the company is growing at a crazy rate doing just bikes. And all I want to do with my time, when I wake up in the morning, all I want to do is go and make bikes look sick. So yep. whilst I can succeed and make money and do everything I need to do out of life doing that, I don't see any reason to diversify. Yeah, um, yeah. If that ever becomes a problem and something drops or I need to do something else, we'll pick something up real quick and get yeah. on another path. But till then, not interested. How many staff have you got? Uh, so at the moment, there's six of us full time. Yep. Um, that number is growing at a pretty crazy rate. Yeah. And um, we anticipate having 11 by this t- the end of next year. No shit. With the growth projection and things like that that we're looking forward to. So it's something that's definitely going to keep growing. Um, yeah. And yeah, we're hiring all Adelaide and staff. And where are you finding people? Uh, it's been a learning experience for myself as well. Yep. You know, I'm young. You know, I've ended up running this business almost unintentionally, as we discovered earlier. Yeah. Um. So at the start, it was hiring friends. Yep. Um. Just because I knew them and they needed money, and I had an ability to give them that. Um, yeah. Well, I won't do that again. You know, there's yep. some good pros and cons of working with people you know, but the con cons do outweigh the pros. Yeah. Um, yeah, it can get real hard. Yeah, and learn that the hard way. Yeah. Um, so then I started, you know, there was a few people I hired which were friends of friends and that worked okay as well. I feel like that's the easiest way to find people in a comfortable format. Yeah. Um, again, not fantastic. What I've done more recently, you know, we've hired, we hired four people at the end of last year mm-hmm. um, and all four of those were put through, you know, 
really tight um, interviews and, and hired and, and sourced for their abilities and their qualifications and things that we felt could add to the business. Um, something I always did was I found people and I gave them the skills I needed to work with me. Yep. However, what I realized I could do is I could find people that had half those skills already, yep. had a skill set that I didn't have, and then I'd teach them the other half, which then gives me a person who has the same ability as someone that I taught everything to. Yep. However, it took half as long to teach them and they actually have a skill set that I don't have, yeah. which helps you build onto your business. You Absolutely. Know, you add abilities and things like that. So that's what I've done much more recently and that's what I'll continue to do. Yep, yep. And and so where physically where did you start? Like you've obviously got some pretty big printers and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And like I've been past your office and I've seen you've got some fucking massive fucking printers, are huge. Yeah. But where the hell did you take over dad's garage? Like what, what were you doing? Yeah, so it all started, like I just had a computer in my bedroom in my house and I was... Yep. Um, I was designing and publisher back in the day and I was sending JPEG files to an, another printery, a company set up like I am now. Yep. Um, and they would recreate the designs into printable files, print them up and ship them to me. And I would then unpack them, repack them how I wanted to and deliver them or post them to my customers. Yep. Um, and it started as that. Um, we then did things like got better equipment, sorry, better software to make it a faster and easier process. We found better uh printeries who could better deal with the capacity therefore supplied a better and faster rate mm-hmm. um, and it was just a slow progression like that until we got to the point where we realized you know what we it's actually probably viable to go out and get a loan and and buy the first printer and we did that and, and moved from there and how much is one of those printers worth uh, so a basic printed about a print what do you need to is somewhere around 30 grand mark <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, so the full setup that we got at the start was a printer and a really, really basic cutter and a really basic laminator. Yeah. And it touched it up to a computer and it was, you know, it was a 50 grand setup or something like that. Yeah. Which, of course, had the good old bank to do. Yeah. Um, but at the time, I already had good traction in the business. So the bank, you know, looked at where I was doing and how much more money I would make out of having the equipment and, and it wasn't um, any more math required than that. Yeah, yeah. So they, they were pretty supportive of you and... Yeah, they were. Um, You know, they were. And I mean, I was a young kid. I still am, as you mentioned. Yep. Um, and I didn't have any guarantor behind me. No one, you know, dad wouldn't sign on, for example. We didn't have anyone backing me, which made it difficult. Yep. They'd hesitate giving a kid that age that sort of money. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I was just persistent. You know, I didn't take no for an answer. You know, when they said, look, this is a bit tough, then I went, did some more research and found some more information to back myself up yep. so that they had, you know, sufficient evidence at some point. And, and so, like, I mean, you, you don't strike me as the type of guy that's going to go into these things blind either. Mm. So, you know... Was it uh, was it a matter of self confidence in that first instance, and just being really, you know, like I'm focused, I have a vision, I know there's a market, and I know that someone else is going to do it if I don't. Yeah. So just get on yeah. with it. And yeah, exactly right. It's you know, I just I back myself. I didn't have any other focus. I knew that that's what I wanted to do, and I knew there was nothing that was going to stop me. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing um, that you know I think anyone can take out of you know a successful small business is you just can't take no for an answer. No is never no. No simply means you've got to find another way around. That's same, exactly right. Yeah. Same answer. No is just another option for you to do some more research and an option to make your your uh, application or exactly. your uh, your business a better rounded uh, uh, possibility for for future growth. And and um, you know, I was talking to a mate the other week and and we came up with a, uh, a you know, just through normal kind of conversations, but um, I think there must have been some beers involved or something like that and. <laughs> And we were kind of saying that it, it's so sad when you do speak to people that are, um, their thoughts are, are much more restricted, I guess, and, the, and they, they're not putting themselves out there. And a lot of the time it's that, well, I can't do it. Mm. And no one was born being able to do everything. We yeah. always learn something. And, and it's when you stop wanting to learn that next thing, when you stop thinking that you can proceed and you can do something better and you can make progress in yourself that's when you do sit on the couch and that's when you do stay at home and that's when you are happy in doing that same thing, that monotonous everyday thing. And, and that's great for some people. That's what they really want and they've got other things in their life. But um, you'll never build a business that way. You'll never uh, build an empire that way. You're never going to be able to um, take take a month's holiday or you're never going to open a, uh, an office in fucking New York. Yeah, exactly. Now, that's, that's something that really took me by surprise the other... <laughs> well, when was it? You posted that up a few uh, weeks ago, yeah, I think. Weeks ago, yeah, I went over there a couple of weeks ago and come back and then announced it to everyone. It was good news. Man, that is awesome. That mm. is... Um, and, and like we were saying before, it's, it's just 
you usually see it going the other way. You usually see these companies that uh, that uh, grow up and mature and whatnot in the States and especially in the motorcycle stuff. I mean, the States is the, easily the biggest market in the world. And um, it's always something from the States that comes here, from the States and comes here. And, and you never know the background of these things and you don't know everyone's story. And it's great to see the opposite happening where over there, they wouldn't know the background. They wouldn't know all the story. Mm. There's so much more for them to discover Yep. Um, but it's come from little old Adelaide. Yeah. And uh, and you were in Melbourne for a while as well, weren't you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. When we first bought the printing equipment, as we were talking about earlier, um, uh, we discovered that the support, so the help that you could get to, you know, learn how to use the machinery and if you had problems, troubleshooting and stuff like that, the, the support of the for the printing company was based in Melbourne. Yep. Um, therefore, if you had an issue with a printer and you needed a problem or something you needed to work out, you're based in Melbourne. It was a 10-minute call-out because of where we moved. We moved literally next to the factory. Yeah, so right. 10-minute call-out to come fix your problem. Yep. Um, if you're in Adelaide, it was a week call-out. Yeah. And now I had never even, I'd literally never seen a printer before in my life. I had no idea how they work or anything like that when I bought one. I don't own one. Yep. I bought one and I still hadn't seen one before in my life. Um, wow. So I knew as a simple fact that there was no way I was going to know how to use it and I was going to have problem after problem after problem learning how to use it for the first period of time so as a result i thought you know what i need to know i need the support where am i going to go the factory's there so i'm going to move right there so i picked up my stuff me and my missus and packed everything away and moved to melbourne with the intent to be there for 12 months or so yep learn everything we needed to learn which is exactly what we did yep. and then once we'd learned what we needed to learn we picked it all back up again and brought it back to Adelaide. And, and you and your partner, sorry, what's your partner's name? Kelsey. Kelsey. So you and Kelsey have been together for a long time. Absolutely, yep. And what does she do? Uh, so she's actually, professionally, she works in childcare currently. Yep. Um, but she's just my rock. She helps me through it all. She's been there through the whole process and made it a yeah. lot easier to get through it all. So she's so if people say you're crazy, she's even fucking crazier, man. Because she's she's gone, nah, man, I'm going with him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't know. Some of the decisions she's made to back me are pretty goddamn impressive, and it takes yeah. takes someone pretty special to be able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but that's exactly part of it. You know, you need the support to do these sort of things, whether it's family or friends or a partner such as Kelsey. Yep. You need someone to back you up because there are times. You know, I put on a tough shell. I think everyone does. Yep. Um, but there are times when it really does get to you know, these issues of whether it be in a relationship or whether it be in a business or whatever. Yep. You know, there's times you just need support. So having someone there such as her to, you know, back me up is a pretty and awesome has step. she ever worked in the, the business with you as well? Absolutely. So when we were in Melbourne for that year, she worked with me full time in the yep. business. Um, at the time, there was a lot of stress. It was a growing company. We were working together. We were living together. It was really tense. You know, we had some pretty hectic you know one-on-ones yeah yeah as I'm yeah sure you can imagine um, absolutely and that's just how the game went um once we brought it back to adelaide she quickly got herself out yep um and like clockwork we became amazing together again and we we're back to the awesome couple we knew we were yep um and it didn't take long for that to get cleaned up uh now she does actually work again in the business one day a week but it's a different yep. it's a different game you know it's not boss and employee which is what it was forced to be when we we're in melbourne yeah it's, yeah you know what sam's running the company he's got his staff here yep. but if i can come and help out for a day here and there she'll do that and she just comes in and does her thing which is fantastic and so you've got yourself and five other guys or you got six Correct. other guys no, no, five other guys yep and um how how do you uh you you're finding them through adelaide they're all adelaide based guys yep. they're all adelaide born and bred absolutely yep 100% uh, um, how, do, how do these guys see their progression within the company yep are so, there people that want to really step up and say like hey man I want to take this with both hands and absolutely and, yeah. and help it grow that's a culture thing I think yep. um, how you manage people in their role and how they are treated around the workplace it directly feeds to that yeah you know, like yep. you get someone that doesn't like his boss and he doesn't care. He's never going to go anywhere. Doesn't want yep. to. Comes in, earns his money, gets the hell out. Yep. I mean, I try very hard to avoid that. Yep. Running culture and staff is a is a skill in itself, man. Absolutely. I'm still learning about all the time. I get things wrong constantly with how to deal with them. Yeah. Of course, we get a lot right. Yeah. But there's a lot of things I'm still learning. Um. But I think yeah, if you can treat them with respect and treat them well, um, and if they're the right personalities to be able to do it back, yeah. Then you can treat each other with the right amount of care that you need to in order to bring the company up as a unit rather than as a boss and employee yeah um, it is a tricky thing to manage because you know there's times where you have to step away and be the boss yeah but if you can bring them up 
close to your level as much as you can and, and feel the success together and talk about it all and sort of bring it up and then everyone feels a part of it, yeah. which of course makes them want to be more involved and, and work with the company going forward, which in, of course in turns to you know pay rises and things like that because everyone's succeeding in this company. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, so did you finish school? No. What year did you get up to in school? Uh, halfway through year 10. So who taught you all of this stuff from year 10 onwards? Uh, no, no, Life. Mean, this stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and um, But that's that's the thing because I, I, I think it's, um, there's there's uh, there's people that learn these skills uh, almost autonomously and they learn it through experience and they learn it through putting themselves into other people's shoes and, and you know, how would I feel if that was happening to me kind of experiences and, and how would I get the best out of myself? Like what, what makes me, what's a catalyst for me to be able to perform and what, how can I provide that to other people? Then there's other people that go and they do all their schooling, they do all their, you know, bloody management degree and, and they go through all their university degrees and they come out into this fresh space and really struggle. And they struggle to engage because they've been put onto this level that they're probably not part of the team and they haven't worked through the team so they struggle to see that progression that that some, sometimes and you know what's that old bloody saying you get uh, you get more bees with honey than you do with vinegar yep. sometimes that's true yep. but there's other times you need to spray fucking vinegar everywhere and you really need to see who's going to stand up and who's going to make the difference because otherwise you're just going to have people hanging on your coattails all day how do you change that how how do you realize that you know like i i assume that you would have had uh, that feeling before of of, uh, of people kind of just dragging you down and and uh, making it hard but how do you because it's not nice to fire anyone and it's not it it's not easy to be fired you know it's just a bad fucking time for everybody involved and i don't think everyone understands that sometimes mm-hmm. but how do you approach it yeah, from a Boston point of view. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh man, tough. Um, we've had to let a couple of people go, and yeah, easily one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Yeah. Um, whether I don't know. I, once you get really far into the business, I think, and you've been doing it for you know twenty years, and you've seen pros and cons, and people hurt your company, and not, I think it makes it a bit easier because yep. you can remove yourself personally. Yep. But I mean, I'm still young. I'm still in it. I still understand. You know, people have got to earn a living, and they do what they can, and it makes that process really difficult. Yeah. Um, I've both times I had to get rid of someone I've literally been sitting at my desk shaking myself yeah. for an hour yeah. beforehand knowing know it was how coming. that feels horrible, yeah. horrible feeling not not something I want to be doing um, I actually went and saw a staff management psychiatrist the last time I was having some big staffing problems yep. spent a bit of time with her and she was fantastic she helped me understand what you know why the per, uh, why the decisions were what they were and why they needed to be that way and then how to deal with someone as far as you know talking with matching their emotions and helping them understand and things mm-hmm. like that um the thing that i always draw back to when i'm having difficult staff moments is at the end of the day this is my business this is the business i created yeah i'm hiring these people to help me build this business and if what they are doing is not benefiting the business then they just don't have a purpose in the business which yeah it's it's played out it's ugly it's not a nice way to put it but it's just how it is and sometimes when you get stuck in that emotion of you know i don't want to do this to this person you know they're a good person they don't deserve this yeah you just have to remind yourself of that you know what at the end of the day i'm running this business if they're not good for the business then they can't be here and it's almost a black and white thing that you don't want to look at in it, it it's it is it is mathematical it is science it is black and white yep. it is just it is what it is but it's still an emotional time mm. it, it's, it's it, I, you've got to be a fucking psychopath if you can lock all of that shit out yeah. and not let it affect you yeah. and um and i know that's why it's important to have a good partner as well of somebody course. to to uh that you can unwind and and, and go back and go fuck it's a terrible day today yeah, exactly yeah exactly right 100 percent. i think it's just yeah it's exactly that it's like you said it's got to be black and white um i spoke to my uncle about it last time i had some issues and yeah. asked him because he's he runs a business um completely different business not any any different size or anything like that but just a different show yep. carpentry or something like that yep and i was speaking to him about it i said how do you go about it man like i find it really hard to get angry with my staff or, or get rid of them when i need to yeah, just, yeah. emotionally i find it tough so what do you do and he turned around and he smiled at me and said you know what sam he's like people will screw you and when they screw you you get harder and you don't care as much next time yeah and it was a cool way to put it and you know it's again blunt but it's it's true you know people hurt you or they'll hurt the business or they will affect you negatively in some way yep. and therefore you just 
you grow a thick skin to the situation, you know. And you can kind of pick it up earlier the next time as well. Absolutely. Like you can see it coming. Exactly. And, and, and because your emotion, if your emotion doesn't withdraw and hold you back from saying things or, or getting a result or, or speaking earlier, yep. like you said, yep. then the problem won't become as gnarly as it needs to be. Yeah. You might be able to manage it so it doesn't even become an issue. Or, you know, you can get them out earlier again so it hurts them less, it hurts you less, it hurts yep. your business less. Yeah. Yeah. And so have you, um, on the business side of things, have you had, uh, have you had help through the, through the state government or federal government? Have you had anyone coming and saying, Hey man, you're, you're employing a few people now. We can see that you're making some growth. Is there anything that we can do to be able to help you succeed within our state or within Australia? Um, not, not really. No. Um, one at the start, something that actually speaks to an earlier question you had in regards to, you know, why did you just go for what happened? What, why did you just yeah, decide yeah. this was it? Which is relating exactly to that. Um, back within the first year of starting the business, I had this fantastic idea. I was going to make these gloves and they were going to be this amazing thing. Did my research, which I felt was enough at the time, um, and end up speaking to my grandparents about a loan. Yeah. Right? An investment, let's say, in my early business. Yep, yep. Um, and they did that and which was you know, pretty brave of them, of yeah, course, yeah. I'm a young kid. So they went ahead and they let me $10,000, right? Which is oh, that's pretty good, man, yeah. Absolutely. Now, <laughs> Thanks, what I did um, back in the day being naive and, and not knowing what I was doing is I actually managed to blow all 10 grand. Yep. And that wasn't necessarily on, that wasn't on parties and things like that, but it was on things that I thought were going to be beneficial yep. and just weren't. There was some research, there was some sample products, there was some event promotions and things like that. Yep. And within literally two months, I had not a dollar of left that left and I had nothing to show for it and I had no traction in the business. Yeah. That, that loan that I had with them, we set it out, we put it on paper, we signed documents, which was you know awesome and cool at the time, um, had a five-year payback on it. Yep. You know, I had paperwork to show that I have it paid back in six months, no worries at all, all of a sudden, no chance. Yep. But what that did at that time was, although I already believed, you know, this is my focus, this is my future, all of a sudden, I had to, I had to fix my problem. I yep. owed my grandparents 10 grand. I was never going to make that working at a fruit shop, which yep. is what I was doing at the time. Yep. I had to make this work. You know, I had no excuse. I had to build it up and make this money and pay them back, yeah. um, which ended up happening as a form of you know growing the business and succeeding and making the money and paying the taxes and before you know it i made my first 10 grand of profit and went straight back to them and then we built from there yep so that's the only ever outside assistance i've had apart from just creating my own capital creating my own green yeah taking loans for equipment things like that yep yep and man 30 grand to go get a printer and well a 50 grand setup is like that's uh (laughs) <laughs> yeah that's a that's a big thing man you got to take a big breath uh big deep breath before you uh jump in a, a pole that deep you know mm. so do you do you think that um that's something that you would have benefited from if you were able to get assistance out of a you know um a small business loan that is designed to be for young people or a, a, a um, business small business assistance that is more accessible to a younger person instead of having to be involved i guess in a, uh, a business essay or if you're involved in a TAFE course that's around you know Cert 2 in business or something like that is do you do you think that that would have helped you or do you think that um, that there was enough that you were able to discover that was going to give you the footings that you needed I think that I straight out like if, if, if my you know I to answer that question I think that what I didn't need was finance yeah like what I didn't need was money because at the end of the day if you have a good business plan and you've got a solid business in line a bank will give you the money yeah and yep. if the bank doesn't give you the money then you shouldn't have the money yeah because your idea doesn't stand up yeah what i think i needed and i would have benefited benefited from was a much more accessible and and easier to get a hold of and really short term uh, uh learning course training course that yep. was run by anyone i didn't care what it was yeah about the very very basics of business yep um School didn't offer anything at the time. There's nothing that teaches you about taxes and about, you know, capital growth and brand positioning and all that sort of stuff. Yep. And maybe, you know, it was in the later years, which I didn't get to. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, there needed to be something there. There's so many things that I've learned about pros and cons of running business and dealing with money and finances and tax and super and all this sorts of stuff that I've never learned. And I didn't learn until I either got it wrong or accidentally came across the answer. Yep. Um, and I think, you know, business... A lot of the time, you know, the stats are ridiculous. It's like it's like eight in ten small businesses don't get past the first two years or something yeah. stupid like that. 
Um, and it's because I like I, a huge percentage of that were just because they didn't have the right information. It wasn't Absolutely. accessible. They didn't yeah. learn. And yeah. whether I, you know, I can't. I don't know how I, the answer or the end goal of that looks like. But I think if the information is more accessible, given to people when they're trying to start this up. Maybe when they apply for an ABN, they're sent some information or whatever it yep. is. But yep. there's just, you know, there's mistakes that are made that are made by everyone. You know, they're always made the same ones. And it just takes a little bit of knowledge to back that up, yep. which will give people the confidence to go for these things and, you know, try Ab- and make absolutely. it Absolutely. And, and that's, um, you know, when we talk about or when, when you know, uh, I guess um, uh, politicians for want of a better word, talk about, you know, we want more people to do this and we think that we should have, uh, you know, 20,000 new apprenticeships. We think that we should have much more uh, young people being retained in our state. That's it. Hmm. What, are, what are the stepping stones? Yep. How are you going to actually grow grow this? You can't just turn around overnight and, and make this a... Um, a political grandstand or, or just a, a faceless promise, you need to have a process behind it. So, you know, I, I, I think you're on the right mark as well. I think that there needs to be short, sharp and shiny courses. Yeah. There needs to be things that you can change direction as quickly as you can follow direction. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're not in it, then you're not in it and you need to find that alternative pathway. Um, it's, it's, I think, through... Uh, you know, and and not trying to blow smoke up your ass, but it's through stories like yourself where yeah. it's like, no, nah, man, I did actually sit down and I worked out how I'm going to get this file from my computer to someone else who's got the equipment to make this happen. That's a really, really good process. It's um, it's it's very easy to point out problems. So easy to point out all the reasons why you can't do something, and it's so hard to find solutions until you start to find them. And once you start finding a solution here or a solution there, you get this process and it's now easy to find solutions. And then people look at you like, fuck man, how the hell did that guy get there? Well, all I did was the same process over and over and over to find solutions. And it just led me to this. Like if, if you yeah, don't have a good 100%. business plan, you shouldn't have that money. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to fuck exactly. yourself, man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Money is definitely not the answer. It's about, yeah. the, it's about yeah. that. getting the knowledge behind yourself to find your answers to your problems and to look yeah. in the right places and to know what to be looking for. It's the biggest thing, you know. You yeah. don't know what you're looking for. What do I need to look out for? So and all that sort of stuff. Do you think that that's something that, um, like, you sponsor a few like uh, professional teams? You sponsor some factory teams and yep. whatnot, don't you? How, how many factory teams do you sponsor? Oh, I don't know. It's not a huge number. I don't think about it too much. Um, yeah. We, we support Honda pretty heavily in Australia, and all of yep. their factory and and lesser supports all their satellite teams and things like yep. that. Yeah. Um, just to get as involved as we can in the sport. Yeah, yeah. So do do you think there is there a reason why they chose SKDA? Do you, do you say SKDA or SK yeah, Design? So very recently, we started saying SKDA because yeah. the, technically the company is two companies now. Yep. One's SK Designs Australia. Yep. And one's SK Designs America. Yep. So you can pretty easily ball leg that by saying SKDA. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> look. Um, yeah. I don't know. Uh, we are. We work pretty hard on customer service. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's a big thing. You know, looking after the customer, making it feel like they're always looked after, and they're never left out in the dark, and they never got annoyed at you for some stupid reason, whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. Um, and that still, that still, you know, um, comes through when you're dealing with the big companies. They need mm. to know that you're going to respond to their requests, and if you say you're going to deliver, you're going to deliver. Yeah. Um, they need someone reliable, whether that. And be, especially when it's a factory team, you can't exactly. have a factory team exactly. going out and looking like a fucking second-rate unit. Exactly. And right. what do people see? Yeah. So all they see is, yeah. is, is the, the graphics that you're putting on, you. on there. Exactly yeah. right. Exactly right. So it's just that. I think reliability is a big thing. Committing to the obligation you've made. You know, if you're going to decide to support a factory effort or, you know, do anything, you know. Was Honda your concept. first one that that, uh, that you did? Uh, uh, not first sponsored uh, outfit. Um, but first, they're, they're, the, they're the big head hold, you know. They're the yep. big company they're with the big riders and the big names. And they're the ones that really put us up, up on a pedestal. Did you have a beer that night? <laughs> when and I got that like, too. Yeah, and just yeah. like, fuck, man, that's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. I was very persistent. Um, I remember speaking to, you know, Yurif Konsky, for example. Yep. He runs, manages one of the teams. I remember speaking to him one of the early days and mentioning I had this thing and I wanted to work with him. And, of course, I was a nobody and I just didn't really get much of a response, which is only warranted. Yep. Um, but I was persistent in letting him know and then persistent in 
growing my own business and it didn't take long for him to come across a point, you know, a couple of years later, literally, where he needed a new support. He'd been watching me because I put that seed in his head all those years yep. ago and watched this business grow. Damn, and who is this kid? I keep running into him. <laughs> exactly. And before you know it, he gave me the opportunity and we just did everything we could to make sure we got it right. Yep. But yeah, I mean, I definitely would have enjoyed my night that night for sure. Absolutely. And it is that, isn't it? It's like you got to grab those opportunities with both hands mm. and 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 give yourself the time to celebrate it as well you know it, it's it's yeah celebrate again it's win. so easy yeah you got to celebrate the wins because you fucking kick yourself when you're down as well Absolutely. like that's so easy to get trapped into that but it um it must have been a uh it, it's a hell of an achievement mm. it's something that you can uh, you can sit back and go man yeah that is my kid yeah that, i think and i think it's a lot of that 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 deal right so the honda deal for example where you work with the big teams and you work mm. with the big riders and like Justin Brayton came down last year from America yep. and he was running SK and it was just fantastic. And I remember after the last round of Supercross when he'd won the title, yep. fantastic. We were walking away from the event a couple of hours later after celebrating and cheering away. And a friend of a friend, someone I was speaking to said to me, they sort of looked over to me and they said, so what do you reckon, Sammy? Like, you know, that deal was worthwhile, wasn't it? He would have made a lot of money out of that one. And he said that in a way, he was a way, he was very intrigued in my response because I think yep. even he knows, you know, the amount of money, time and effort to put into f- supporting a factory effort. One, it's almost impossible to calculate the return yep. because it comes out in exposure. Yep. But on top of that, there's a very good chance they're actually, from a, from a money point of view, there wasn't a good return. There wasn't a return yep. that paid you back. Yep. And what I said to him and what I stand by is that was a personal goal. That wasn't a personal achievement. Mm-hmm. I got to work with Justin Brayton and the Honda team. Exactly. And we just won a title with yep. SKDA graphics on the bike. Yep. And I would pay every dollar I had in my life if I knew that that's what I could achieve one day and I could get to that point. And it yeah. was about that. You know, there's some things that you do that don't have to be about the money yep. or whatever. You know, money's just, it's just there. And that's where the passion steps but in, But it's isn't the passion, it? exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Which it's, I feel like has fed the whole system. It's made it all possible is my just drive and passion for it. But at the yep. end of the day, sometimes you can gain from that on a passion and personal loss side as well. Yeah, That was yeah. an amazing night and an awesome achievement. And personally, I just felt like a king. You know, I felt amazing. Yeah. And the money didn't even, wasn't even on the table. And so, have have you been able to top that? Is that the is that the pinnacle that you've got, or have you oh, have man. you? Uh... Nah, I don't know. This US thing was pretty cool. Setting up this, setting up an office in New York was a pretty crazy feeling. And you had a really cool fucking picture, and um, it was just uh, it looked like it was it looks like you're bloody jet lagged, and you're in the middle of fucking Times Square or something. You've just kind of got this selfie, and it's like I'm here. Well, who the fuck is he? <laughs> what the hell is going on? Yeah, and yeah, setting up a uh, setting up an office in the Big Apple, mm. a little bit different than, uh, where are you, Stepney? Yeah. A little bit different than Stepney. Absolutely. But um, what uh, what was the, you know, there's a point, I guess, where there's a catalyst and there's a great idea and you do all the research and then there's biting the bullet. Mm-hmm. Was it when you got on the plane? Was it when you actually, like, walked through into, you know, international kind of fucking departures and, wow, this yeah. is real? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I don't know, I just, I when I get something in my head and I know what I want to do, I just barrel down, you know, nothing's going to stop me. That's what I'm going to do. So it started even before that. Um, I think when I, when I was in New York, there was pretty cool feelings, you know, it's actually the first time I've been overseas and I went over to set up the company. (laughs) Um, But, you know, it was a cool feeling. I was stoked and it was exciting. And I signed the papers and for the uh, um, office and the bank accounts and that was cool as well. But it was way before that. It was a month before that when I decided this is what I'm going to do. Looked at it all, set it all up, did all my research, got it all done and put it all down on paper and that's when it started you know because how many, I knew how many hours a day do you work at the moment it's pretty good I, i've pulled it right back okay um because you know i'm trying to focus on my relationship and my, yeah yeah my yeah houses my sorry e-house yeah and all the other sort of things you got to do as a human yeah um but there was definitely some hectic times when i was in melbourne i was working oh, three three a.m until 10 or 11 p.m seven days a week Again, you know, my missus was definitely not a fan of that time of no, our lives. No, um, But that's what had to be done at that stage, you know. Yep. You'd, you know, there was mistakes being made daily because I was learning what I was doing, yep. costing us money. You had to recoup that and continue to push and get every job done you could get done and satisfy every customer. So 
the hours were necessary. It's it's uh, it always strikes me, and, and there's you know there are definitely people that I've met and I've known in my life that really do envisage that and they embody that, and and that's what they're all about is is grabbing those opportunities keeping up the grind, fucking hustling where they need to hustle and just making things happen where it needs to happen. And then there's this whole other bunch. And um, I, I think I'd like to refer to them as the cotton on kids. And it's they all have the motivational fucking Facebook and Instagram posts and they've got the fucking the trendiest of the trendy fucking shirts and shoes and all this and that. But they don't ever have anything before anyone else has got it. And they only ever follow the crowd. And it's something you said before is that, you know, we I don't look at something to follow a trend. I want to be in front of that trend. I don't I don't care what it is. I just want to get in front of that because that's where I believe I should be. It how how do you take it when people um uh, might uh, criticize your designs or might cr- criticize yourself within your business or or how how do you deal with that and and just kind of take it do you take it with a grain of salt do you um do yeah. you, do you now, let that inspire you nowadays i do nowadays i do back at the start i didn't i, I every, hit me every time every time yep. i got a negative comment on facebook yep. or i got someone talk to me negative about my work or what i was doing I would, it would sledge me man it would just rock my world yep. because i was so passionate and so insanely obsessed and involved in this company that i was running yep. um that you know it, it wouldn't take much you know i could get a hundred positive feedbacks and one negative and it just shake my whole week yep. and it would just wreck me i remember crying literally at times yep. just from bad feedback yeah um, yeah because it just it's do you remember person. the worst one? Oh man um uh, one that pops to my mind really quickly was a customer who had ordered something for a race on the weekend that they needed this was before i was printing myself yep so i got the files prepared send them off told the printers i need this to be done by this time guys um they end up getting it the customer had it shipped to them at the event so that they would have it in time. Um, I was relying on the printery to do that and they didn't, and they didn't revive on time. Yep. And the customer called me up and just lost it, lost their marbles, went off their tree. Um, somewhat warranted because they were now left hanging without numbers in their bikes, which they needed. Yep. I understand that, you know, not a nice situation, but man, rocked me, rocked yep. me. I was still working part-time at that point. I remember leaving work, went and sat in my car and I was sitting there for two hours just bawling my eyes out, didn't know what to do, just felt horrible about it. Yep. And that was one customer. Yeah, yeah. It was a yeah. $100 order. It didn't yeah. matter. You know, the yeah. business was never going to get affected by it, but I was that personally involved that that sort of stuff just wrecks you. Yeah. However, now, like I'm at the point where I know my product is fantastic, my service is good, everything we do is good. Those negative comments, you get them, but yep. I'm, I'm, a, I'm now able to look past them and as long as I don't become a majority in any way shape or form well it's yeah it's not something that needs <laughs> to affect the business do you still think about that that uh, that comment that negative feedback that little fucking catalyst that uh, at the time may have hurt so much but may be a driving force for so long yeah yeah I do well it popped in your head there. I mean that popped in my head really quickly then so yeah. it must be something that I can yep, yeah it's still sitting um, there somewhere and I just remember how much it just shook me emotionally yeah um, which just proves it, it just speaks straight to the fact that you know I'm just obsessed with this thing, and that's why it's worked because yep, the yep. passion and the drive and the obsession and the general emotion involved in it all. Have have you have you you know to flip that on its head? I mean, besides the Justin Brayton and the Honda team and all of that stuff, I mean that's a really high pinnacle. But out of kind of um, I guess normal people, <laughs> yep, yep. what what's the biggest compliment that you've got? What's what's the uh, what's the best feedback that you've got? Uh, I reckon. I reckon it was actually my father. So I remember quite specifically um, that when I first started out with the idea, actually it was before that, when I was riding bikes in my you know, late teens, yep. um, my parents split up and that was all done and gone. And I remember speaking to my father a couple of times and whether it would be in direct words or in some other form or shape, um, he had hinted to me that, you know what, you know, you're going to have to find something else. Like it's awesome that you love bikes and it's wicked that you're doing it, but you're going to need a career at some point. You know, you're not going to make money out of motocross yep and that was the line you're not gonna make money out of motocross yep and that was cool you know all good happy days um here we are now making money out of motocross yeah um, that yep. a passion that grew into a business that became something and you know not too long ago maybe a couple of years i remember dad saying to me one day like i'm just son i'm i'm very proud of you what you're doing is fantastic i'm generally awed by the work you're doing um and that was nothing to do with my design quality it was just a you know a word from someone who means a lot to me and yep. who I thought was on the other side of the fence and it just shook my world. It was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, and and they're the things you really need to 
you need to fucking hold on to, don't you? Exactly. You know, it, it fires you up, and you get yeah, going. absolutely, and and it, it's that thing that uh, yeah, it fires you up. It fires you up, doesn't it? Mm. It, it it really kind of makes it worthwhile. Absolutely, makes it worthwhile, and makes those three a.m. bloody exactly, <laughs> mornings. Yeah. And, and I mean, he's a he's a he's a fantastic example. But there's it's all those it's those people that they don't have to be a Justin Brayton. It's yep. someone that somehow you are emotionally invested in, whether that be because they're an idol, yep. Justin, or a, or. A close friend or a family member yep. when you hear things like recognition or support from someone who means that much to you that's when you really feel it in a do, positive way do you feel like an artist mm, no I no i think so do you do you what do you think the difference between an artist and a designer is we've had this i've had this discussion with hey. people before <laughs> it's an interesting <laughs> one um i think that a a designer rearranges things to look a certain way, right? So they mm-hmm. things that already exist, right? They yep. rearrange them or move them or color them or whatever to make them look good in the space that they're in. Mm. Um, whereas an artist will literally create something that doesn't exist from nothing and make it somehow look great. Yep. Um, like your eyes on the wall, which I can see, you know, there's never going to be an eye that's stuck in blue or a pair of eyes or whatever, you know, that's an artist. Someone created that and came up with that concept. Yep. Whereas what I do as a designer and what designers do, I feel, is they you know they have a canvas and you've got five objects and what you've got to do is put them on that canvas the best way you can to yep. make it look and complement itself. That's a that's fucking good difference. explanation. Yeah, and I mean, there's no education behind that. I mean, I'm not that, that could be completely Ooh, wrong. No, I'm sure that it there's sounds an good though. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there's an answer. <laughs> I'd agree with it, that. but that's how I see it. Yeah, absolutely. I had we had an artist that worked for us once, and he could do that very, very well, but he yep. couldn't do the design stuff so well. It's yeah. a very big difference. And I mean, I can't, I can't, I couldn't think I could be an artist. However, navigating space, I can do. And what, what's, I mean, what's the other thing that you need the most in your business besides somebody who's a great designer? And obviously, you need someone with passion. You need someone who's committed. You need someone who's actually going to fucking rock up at work, and you're going to need all those things. But do you need someone who's good at logistics, someone who's good at answering the phone, someone who's good at just organizing? You know, what, what do you think's the, the the number one thing that, um, I mean, I'd probably call yourself a, a medium-sized business. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It depends which angle you're looking at it from. Look yeah. at it from Nike, we're tiny, but look at it from, I don't know, yeah. a couch salesman, maybe not. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, uh, it, I think we hire for the role. Um, so those things you mentioned, you know, that you said, you know, of course it's this and of course it's that, they are essential. You know, yep. having someone with drive, someone with focus, someone with passion, someone with interest, massive. You, yep. If you don't have those things, you're not interested. Don't knock on the door. Yeah, because you, you need that. Um, the ability to work is a really important one. Yeah. You know, someone who can actually shut up and work yep. and focus on working and come yeah. out with a result. You know, it's hard to find those people, man. Oh, absolutely. You know? And I think everyone has it in them, but whether they decide to apply it or not is a different thing. Yeah, I think it's a very environmental thing for some people as well. And, and like, you know, it, it's uh, it's really easy to get off task when you're in some certain groups mm-hmm. and, other, and, and it's hard to change that dynamic once it starts happening. And once that starts happening, you, you're two weeks behind. Yep. And you're like, man, you're a great bloke. But Mm. shit, dude, I know you've done all your work, but now you're talking to everyone else and no one else got a fucking thing done. So what the hell are we doing here? Exactly. But is is there that... um, is there a skill set that you believe that you still haven't kind of found someone with that? Is there... Uh, is there something yet, that you're always yet. thinking, damn, I wish I had someone who could do that? Um, even recently, for example, I, I jotted down on a piece of paper, I, I made out a graph and I was like, okay, these are the people I have. And I wrote the 15 things that I think are necessary in our workplace. Yep. Um, and then I highlighted boxes for each of them and said, okay, he's good at this, this and this. And this guy's good at this, this and this. And he's this, this and this and so on and so forth. This guy's not so good at that, for example. And then all of the roles that we have within our workplace, you know, we've got six people, so that's six different roles, Mm -hmm. six different sets of skills. Um, You then apply them accordingly to whatever task needs to be done. Um, So you said, you know, speaking good on the phone, there's two different tasks in our workplace that that is essential for. If you're not good at talking on the phone, you can't fit that bill. However, I've got people that aren't good at talking on the phone. They never will be. They're just not that sort of people. Yeah. But I still have roles for them. They're essential and, and fantastic roles. Yep. Um, so I think no one's pros or cons will knock them out of contention for a job with us or a job with many companies because everyone would have the same mindset. Yep. It's, you know what, you've got pros and cons, so how can we apply them? And whether I'm hiring for a role, so I need to find someone for a job, or whether I've got people and I need to put them into roles, mm. um, Pros and cons, man. I don't think there's anything you can put your finger on. Is there one job that everybody hates doing? <laughs> um, yeah, what, we've what's got... What's the fucking worst? Yeah, there's one. There's one. So we've got <laughs> these little wiper blades, they call, which go into the printers and they clean the bottom of the printer head. 
um, and they we pull them out probably two a day or something like that. And they're all covered in ink and gunk, and we put them in a little container full of solution. And once a week or once a fortnight, someone's got to go and empty this container and clean them all out. Yep. It's not. It's fine, you know. No one's cleaning toilets. It's a simple job. It's not yep. a difficult thing to do, but it's just annoying and it's tedious and it's painful and no one enjoys doing it. Yep. And yep. whenever I say, Payton, it's your day, mate. You've got to go and do a wipe of blades. It's a big hey that goes around the office and he's like, oh, and it's a big laugh and everyone has a good time. Yep. We try and make sure there's a roster so it doesn't happen to the same person twice. Yeah, or you can just pick on that one person and it's just like, man, you've been pissing me off exactly. this week. You know what? Yeah. But I did that last week. Well, fuck you, man. You're doing it again well, this the week. Last, man. <laughs> yeah. So do you get your hands dirty and do that as well? Yeah, I do. I do. Because I, and I do it intentionally and I want to make sure that yeah. people know when I do it. You know, I want to make sure that people understand, look, this, I'm even in this workplace. We're all here. We've yep. all got to do the work. And, and that's part of the culture, isn't it? Work. That's part of that culture that keeps people wanting to work for the company Absolutely. and wanting to work Absolutely. for the boss is working for yourself and, and making sure that everybody kind of has that feeling is a is an important thing. Absolutely. Someone said to me not long ago, you know, the biggest difference between a boss and a staff member is, and the reason that the, 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 the staff can respect the boss as being the boss, even when you bring yourself down to that level, mm. is when they need someone to bat for them, you know, there's something's gone wrong, there's a big problem or whatever, the boss is the one that stands up and fixes it. Yep. And whether that's literally going and doing the wipe blades every now and then, because no one else wants to do it, or whether it's, you know, the company just got a massive bill and we're about to shut down and someone needs to fix a problem. That's how you differentiate yourself. If you're the one that goes to bat when the problems are out, then they'll all respect you and sit down when they need yep. to. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So besides design, work, slugging your guts out, what else do you do, man? What do you mean? I mean what else do you outside do? Outside of work in Yeah, general? yeah. Oh man, not much. <laughs> not much. <laughs> it doesn't man. sound like there's lots of time. I mean, no. So you're going to buy a house. Yeah, I'd love to do that. You getting soon. married? Yeah, I am actually. Yeah, oh, my, nice. My, my wedding's in three weeks. Nice. That's well really, done. Really Thanks excited. for the invite. Yeah. Fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> nah, so I'm really excited about that. That'll be awesome. Yep. You know, as we mentioned, my missus is fantastic. Yep. Really looking forward to a future with her. Um, and you know, I've done the hard yards. You know, I've, of course they're not over, but I've done the hard yards. I've got yep. this business up and moving. I've done those three a.m. till ten p.m. nights and weeks and consecutively. And, yep. you know, I've done that work, which means the business is now a point where I can work. You know, I'm working seven till four every day, yep. five days a week. And That's weekend. still a long day, man. <laughs> but is it? It's um, it longer than mine. <laughs> you know, I can go home at the end of the day and, you know, spend time with missus or yep. go and see family and enjoy my weekends. And yeah. so I'm just slowly starting building that sort of personal side of my life a bit yep. as we speak. You know, it's something I'm working on. Um, so it's something that I hope to see flourish. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. And you're still writing? Yeah, yeah, inconsistently. Yep. Um, I'll ride once a month or once every couple just with friends for fun, but I've got a bike there and I do enjoy getting out on one. What, what are you riding now? Um, I've got a Honda CRF 450. Cool. Um, of course, you know, being so heavily involved with Honda, with Honda I have to make yeah. sure that yeah, I'm on Yeah, sounds red. like a good idea. Absolutely, and it's an awesome <laughs> bike. I love the thing, the thing's a rocket, so I yep. really enjoy getting out on that. And how, how much power are those things putting out nowadays? Oh, I don't know. I heard Stupid the other day amount. that the 2019 Honda 450 is going to have 60 horsepower, wow. which is just a Ridiculous. Ton. It's a lot of... It's a lot of power for something that weighs 100 kilos. Yeah, yeah, 100 kilos and you're on dirt. Mm, it's pretty hectic. Fuck, mm. man, that but is they're crazy. Good they're a and lot of fun. Uh, they've all got launch control and traction control and shit like that nowadays, do they? Or? Yeah, well, no, I don't even know, man. I don't ride the things. But they've all got technology <laughs> that makes them ride well. So yep, yep. I'm satisfied. <laughs> so if you weren't doing this, what do you think you'd be doing? I don't know. I actually asked myself that the other day. I was thinking about it. I was talking to my missus, in fact. I'm like, what would I be doing? Like, where would I be? Mm. And I don't know. I generally don't know. Before I got into bikes, before I got into the sticky game, I was working full time at a fruit and veg shop, and really enjoyed that. Um, yep. Never something I was planning to do forever, but it was a good job, and I enjoyed it. You know, yep. doing big hours and working the markets and things like that. But even then, I knew what, what were you doing? Uh, loading trucks and, okay. and, and emptying shelves and loading shelves and stocking them up and things like that. Yep, yep. Um, just back end stuff for fruit shops, um, and I really enjoyed it at the time, but it was not something I wanted to do. Um, but I. I knew I was not going to end up doing that. Even then, before I was yeah. thing, I knew that's not what I was going to end up doing. And then yeah. once I got that sticker idea, you've got to keep in mind, I was 19. Yeah, yeah. And that was a sole focus. And I never stopped thinking about it since. And that was all I was going to do. So from that point, from oh, I don't really know what I'm going to do to, you know what, it's stickers. Bang. That's it. I've never thought about it. So I've never needed to. So I, I can't tell you. What, what do you think made you so steadfast in that direction? Was it because it was a motorcycle thing? Was it just because you got to do your drawing and you got to do your design kind of stuff? Or? Yeah, passion, 100%. Um, that passion was always the initial driver and even to still to today. You know, I talk to people for 10 minutes about my yep. business that I've never met in my life. Yep. And they say to me, you're so passionate, which yeah. you know, it must come out. 
Um, that 10K debt that I created for myself in the early days held me in it for six months, you know, yep. or more than that, of course. Yep. But it held me in it when some of the times were tough. Yeah. Um, but apart from that, it's just been the passion to just keep going and get that win. And so you've, ob- like, you've obviously had a lot of successes in there. You did touch on, so the first thing you did, you wanted to make gloves. Mm. Do you still make gloves? No. Nah. Um, that, that was a fantastic learning curve. Yep. Um, did the research, got prototypes made from Pakistan, it was. Yep. Had them sent here, made them changes, did it again. Um, overseas manufacturing is a hard game, you know? Yeah. It's a, it's a tough thing. Especially to gloves. Exactly. And especially, especially gloves. Especially for someone who's uneducated, as I mm. said, had no yep. education. Yep. It was a tough thing to do. Um, lost out on it, made some gloves. Eventually got some products in my hands that were good, you know? They were, they were rideable. It was a rideable product. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I didn't have the knowledge or, or or money behind it to do the marketing things like that. So yeah. it never really took off. And to get it distributed and in shops and whereas a sticker kit, which you design once, buy once, so the outlay of it was three hundred dollars and sell mm-hmm. once for four hundred, and you've got a hundred dollars profit a week later. Yep, um, was a much uh, easy game to sort of get into and move slowly and take off. And yep. so whilst this glove project was going on, that was costing me bunches of money and never really made much back. Yep. I still had this steady sort of move happening with the graphics yeah so, yeah you know, once that became too difficult i just came back and focused one of the on most stuff. interesting things i think um and correct me if i'm wrong i think it was around 2015 or maybe 2014 that um you started doing goggles mm. and it was at a time goggles were like super competitive there yeah. was like you know oakley were coming out with their new air brake stuff and they were coming out with different retention systems and and uh, fucking roll-offs. There was a whole roll-off debacle. I don't know if that still goes on or yeah. if you can use tear-offs again or, or what it is. Are you still doing goggles? Uh, yeah, uh, on a very low scale. Yep. Um, once again, that was something fantastic. I saw a gap. I, I, had, a, I had my own helmet. I had an aero helmet. Yep. Um, and I bought myself a pair of drag and NFX goggles, they were called. Yep. Big, massive, broad yep. things that didn't have a frame on them. They were yeah. fantastic because you got a really good vision. Problem was, my aero helmet, which has a very small face, the big goggles literally wouldn't fit. Yep. So I wanted the aero helmet because it was light. You just dust in your eyes. And <laughs> and then the goggles that I wanted to use, I couldn't. So I said, you know what? Let's fix the problem. So I went out and I made a goggle that was a really wide vision, as the NFXs are, but mm-hmm. it was small enough to fit in my helmet. Yep. Um, that was my aim. That's what I did. And I made it happen. I got them in and I started promoting them. And initially, they were doing really well. Yeah. Um, it was only ever to be a side project, you know. Yeah. At the time, even SK was doing a lot better than the goggles were. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, 2015, I think, somewhere around there. Yeah. Um, but the not too long after that, the roll-off rule came in. So yeah. tear-offs, which are the cleaning system on simple goggles and always have been, were banned in Australia because of littering purposes, yep. which I actually support. I think that's probably a worthy cause. Yeah. Um, therefore, my goggles, which were a tear-off goggle, suddenly became ineffective and unsellable. Um, and until I adapted a roll-off system, which is a very complex and expensive thing to do Absolutely. well, well <laughs> which is why only Oakley's done it, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, still having drummers with it at their size. Yep. Um, it just literally put me out of the game, put me out of contention. So I've still got plenty of those goggles. Yep. Um, and I still use them to ride with it because I think they're fantastic. For, yeah, yeah. To do what I wanted them to do, best goggle I've ever come across because, yep. of course, that's why I made them. I made yeah. them to be yeah, the best. Yeah. They are. Um, however, I didn't set myself up to do roll-offs and I decided not to spend any more of you know, makes a successful business's money on yep. something that perhaps wasn't going to go the same way. What do you think the number one thing is that you have to nail before you put one of your uh, one of your graphics out to sale or one of your products out to sale? What is that thing that you just go fucking has to have? Yeah, um, oh, I don't know. I, we have we have a few different things that we feel like we have to have in order to keep this company being successful. Um, the design style that we've adapted, whether it be you know real clean and crisp, which is what we do, um, and you know really not following trends, doing mm-hmm. our own thing, that's essential. People yep. know us for that now, and they expect it. They don't want to see something that everyone else has got because they yep. don't. If they wanted that, they wouldn't come to us. Yeah, they want something that's different, and they know they can get it from us. So we yep. have to continue with that, which is what we want to do anyway. So that sort of feeds pretty easily. Yeah, um, and then holding up the quality of the product and the customer service are two really big things. Is there anything that you miss about uh, riding all the time or the... No, I don't know. It was another stage in my life, you know. Yeah. Like I had, you know, parents were supporting me to ride when I was younger and it was a whole lot of fun and I'd ride three times a week and race every weekend and it, yeah. was, it was a time my life was fantastic. I think it was a really good thing for me as a kid. Um, you know, it gives you something to focus on and keep yourself out of trouble and things like that when yeah. you've got something to look forward to at the end of the day or on the weekend or whatever it was. 
of course you don't have all have these opportunities but for me it was fantastic yep um but it was a different stage of my life you know i don't envy it i'm, I, I'm glad that i had it and i think i've learned a lot and valued that time in my life a lot but yeah i'm just sure. at a different stage now you know i wouldn't want to be writing that much because i'd want to be spending my time doing other things now yeah yeah you're about to get married and buy a house and uh, where are you going on your honeymoon uh, US actually yeah, we're gonna spend <laughs> you're not going to do time. work yeah, are you we, we'll fucking hell Sam <laughs> we'll spend a lot of time doing work and we're going to California which is the hub of motocross in the US yep, you know, yep. that's where all bases so we'll do some honeymoon stuff but I guarantee you there'll be a lot of stuff that's not so what made you set up in New York and not, not California not LA uh, we when we were doing our research for incorporating a company in the US which is a very difficult thing to do if you're not a US citizen mm-hmm. very difficult red tape like you wouldn't believe um the support we could find, the lawyers we could find, the information we could find was all based around New York as a city. Okay. Um, the firm that we end up getting involved with to help us set it up were based in New York um, and everything else just seemed to land there. So that's where we ended up. Um, yeah, right. It was nothing more than the research and, and the uh, assistance we gained ended us with us ended with us in New York. So that's where we landed. So it's kind of an organic process Absolutely. that you went through it wasn't through. a decision it wasn't yep. a, it wasn't a conscious decision we weren't like yep new york it was just you know what the decision the information's here yep. the result is here it happens to me in new york no problem we just needed the result we didn't care where it was yeah yeah that's awesome that's awesome well is there anyone you want to shout out is there anyone that you want to uh, make sure they get a thank you or uh, or I fucking piss off is there anyone that you want to bag out <laughs> uh, no look i don't know i've, I've said it before you know I've, i i write it on my facebook around then to sort of thank everyone i'd yeah the support that I received in the business right from the start, both good and bad. You yeah. know, there's like I said, even the sledges help you out in some yeah, special yeah, way. Yeah. Um, so the support's been fantastic and it's sort of helped me get to this point. Um, you know, people close to me, like my family, friends and my, my missus, and then of course, you know, people further away, just the support given to a young company that needed it. Yeah. Um, helps you get through the times and helps you grow as a business and make an idea into something more than that. Yeah. Um, but I mean, apart from that, you know, I've just got to I'm stoked that I had the passion and drive I did to keep pushing through when the times were tough and then you end yep. up where you need to be, you know. You can't rely on anyone or there's no one that can take credit yep. for where I've got to because of the fact that, you know what, there's assistance, but without the assistance, without your own, you know, passion and drive, you're just not gonna get there. So yeah. sometimes yeah. you gotta you can't rely on other people, you know, you gotta thank them for their support and, and and use that assistance but if you're not in it you're not in it so yeah and and mate well done well done because i i think it is a a really admirable thing and and it shows so much drive and for uh, a a young fella from adelaide from south australia to be doing such a, a magnificent amount of work and making a huge impact and and in a scene that you know i've known quite easily and quite well over the many many years now it um it definitely makes you kind of step back and go fuck me <laughs> that's a fucking good effort so well done mate Thanks, it's uh, it's Appreciate really it. inspiring to see and, and hopefully some people listen to this well hopefully just in general people listen to this but uh, hopefully people listen to this and go you know what fuck it man if that guy can do it well why can't I yeah exactly and I think that's the big message out of the whole yep. thing you know of my story up to now and obviously even going forward yeah, you know, everyone yeah. there's so many people that told me there's no chance you know you're not yep. going to do it stop wasting your time you're not making it but if you if you Focus on it and decide that there is no way you're not going to get to where you want to get to. Mm-hmm. Then you're right, and you will yeah. be every time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's that old. What are they? You, you go where you're looking. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's another another one I've heard, which is when you want to succeed as badly as you want to breathe, only then will you succeed. And I think that's it. You know, like you know, you have to breathe. If you hold your breath long enough, all you want is air. And if yeah. you want to succeed as bad as that, and then you'll get it every time. Although I did see a thing the other day, and it's like Ninja Dude, he um he was choking people out, and he was describing being choked out, and and even the, he choked this like uh, this journalist out, and um and the guy came to, and he's like, see, I told you, man, it's just like a really good sleep, isn't it? Like, <laughs> what the fuck is this dude on? And the journalist turned around, and he goes, you know what? I think you're right. Like it just feels like I've just slept for, like eight hours or something. I'm like maybe that's the trick instead of yeah. micro sleeps. Get yourself knocked out. Yeah, just get yourself choked out. I like that. Although I, I think that's how fucking the um the guy from NXS died. Right. Yeah. Maybe so control not. it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Thanks, man. Easy. Legend. Awesome. <laughs>